Thank you very much for the opportunity. I have no disclosures. Koli Dokudu Anastomy has been around a long, long time. Uh, it was actually first performed in 1888, and that's six years after the first open cholecystectomy. And its development really kind of paralleled open cholecystectomy uh, in a lot of ways. Prior to the era of ERCP and sphincterotomy, it was, co it was commonly performed during open cholecystectomy when done with a common bile duct exploration. And at that time, patients often presented with more advanced stone disease, so it made a lot of sense. However, today it's infrequently required due to advanced endoscopic capabilities, as well as patients presenting you know, fairly early in their course with stone disease. The indications uh, Dr. Kent went over, but I'll just kind of emphasize that I think it's important to have a multidisciplinary approach when choosing the right patient for this operation, specifically getting not only the patient uh, involved, especially when it's to uh, um, spare them recurrent endoscopic intervention in the future, but also uh, getting advanced uh, GI endoscopy involved in the decision-making process. So I perform my cholidoco duodenostomies laparoscopically uh, with port placements uh, as shown, kind of a variation of um, the way I put ports for a lap whipple. Uh, I, I use usually five ports, two twelves and three fives as shown. I can sometimes get away without the far right lateral five millimeter uh, port. And then I use a liver retractor in the uh, left upper quadrant uh, port, five millimeter uh, trocar. So most of these patients have had previous cholecystectomy, so the first part of the operation is usually taking down adhesions, restoring um, the normal anatomy. You can see here, here's the cystic duct stump with the um, clip attached. And then, like was mentioned, I uh, do a pretty decent coker maneuver to really mobilize the, uh, the duodenum well and to get it to really be nice and floppy um, up against the, uh, the, the common bile duct. Then as uh, you get more superiorly on the duodenum, really come right down on that anterior wall of the uh, common bile duct and expose it well. There's no reason to get behind it. A lot of times these patients have had um, a lot of inflammation, cholangitis, so really you're just gonna get into trouble trying to get circumferentially around that. And then that view is really what you wanna see right there where you have, let's see if this works here where you have the, uh, the common bile duct, nice and big and plump right here. This right here is the proper hepatic artery. And then you have the duodenum nice and, uh, and floppy and right there, just waiting to be hooked up. In terms of the anastomosis, I also use a uh, diamond-shaped anastomosis with a uh, longitudinal um, cholidocotomy and duodenotomy. And then I think one helpful tip is to think about the anastomosis in uh, quarters. So I kind of, I usually put a, a stace suture, which I'll show you in a second, in the inferior aspect of the uh, cholidocotomy, which kind of lines up where your anastomosis is gonna line up. The um, other thing with this anastomosis is, you know, thinking about it in terms of quarters, it makes more sense to go from inferior to superior, where your visualization um, won't be impeded by starting from superior. So once you've, you've found your, your spot for your cholidocotomy, this is just making the incision. This patient had pretty extensive stone disease. And whenever I th you're getting ready to extract stones, I think it's useful to kind of open a ray tech and have it just nearby. And that way you can put stones in the ray tech and then um, you know, close it down at the end and extract it from a, um, from a extraction bag without spilling them all over. This is a cholidocoscope uh, going up and looking into the um, intrahepatic bile duct. And what you can do from there is um, this is a red rubber going into the bile duct and just kind of flushing out some of these remnant stones that were higher up um, in the duct. And so this is uh, making the duodenotomy, again, longitudinally. And here's that inferior uh, stitch, which is just a uh, simple interrupted, just to kind of hold that uh, in place and kind of take some tension off the inferior aspect and really kind of line it up. And then from there, uh, just like I, I mentioned, just thinking about it in terms of quarters. And so starting with the left inferior quarter, 
of the anastomosis and proceeding superiorly. This is 4-0 PDS. I like PDS for specifically, really, almost only for this anastomosis. I usually use Vicryl, but I think PDS is really nice here because it'll slip, and it'll slip after a couple uh, throws. So when, when you get up to the top, it's useful uh, because you don't have to pull it up all the way, and it'll let you see better, and it's, um, it's easier to, visu to get visualization and then pull up at the end. One, one thing here I'll point out is there's a, a stay suture here in the side of the... Um, of the cholidocotomy, which is often helpful, especially with smaller ducts, in kind of you know opening that anastomosis. And this is just proceeding with the right inferior quarter of the anastomosis, again, from inferior to superior. And so once you're halfway, you should see this. So you have your uh, kind of triangle of your remaining uh, cholidocotomy, and then kind of a semicircle of your uh, uh, duodenotomy left to sew. And at this point, I, uh, I use a separate stitch to sew from uh, 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 superiorly to the apex, just because I think it takes tension off of the, um, you know, it, uh, essentially distributes tension on the stitches as you're kind of going from inferior to superior. And then once you get up to the apex, like I mentioned, leaving that stitch loose so that now here's the right upper quadrant being sewn. Um, you can see better because that stitch is kind of a little bit loose and it lets you get visualization, then you can pull up at the end and tie down your, um, your stitch. And then you should have a nice, big, widely patent anastomosis. Ideally, your anastomosis should be about two and a half to three centimeters, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. So I think common pitfalls uh, for this operation uh, include include things like misidentifying the common bile duct, and that sounds silly, but when you have a patient who's had recurrent cholangitis and a lot of inflammation and scarring in the area, it actually can be a little bit difficult. And there's where things like ultrasound and even needle aspiration to confirm the presence of bile can be useful. Too much tension, obviously that's a, that's a well-known pitfall and that for that. I think the coker maneuver, uh, an adequate coker is important. Inadvertently performing a cholidocal gastrostomy. Uh, I've been close a couple times to doing this one. Um, really, sometimes the stomach will be very redundant and it'll look like it'll lay re really nice, uh, or it looks like the part of the bowel that's laying right up against the, um, the common bowel duct is the stomach, but after you do a coker, it'll actually, um, the duodenum will almost always uh, set really nice up there. And then performing the anastomosis in uh, patients with adequately sized bile ducts, and that's just a, a function of having an anastomosis that's big enough. And then I think the optimal size is about two and a half to three centimeters for the cholidocotomy. This is just a, a, a video from a surgeon. So this patient had um, pretty extensive previous scarring. You can see that's, uh, he believes that that's the bile duct right there. And so he's just, um, going to make his cholidocotomy there, and he's like a centimeter deep into it, and still no bile, still no bile. And so, you know, this is dangerous, right? You know, obviously, you're digging into the porta hepatis. You, you don't know what this, where you're at. You're kind of lost. And so he's just kind of digging. And, and then he gets the ultrasound out, and right away knows exactly what's going on, because he was actually dissecting in between the remnant cystic duct and the common bile duct, and he's pointing it out there. And so, and then confirming the presence of bile within the uh, common bile duct here with a needle aspiration. And so I think, especially when scarring's present, the ultrasound is nice to, you know, keep you out of trouble and to really um, be sure you know where you're, you know, what you think is what it is, it is what it is. Just a very little bit on complications. So wound infections, anastomotic leak, that's those are complications with any biliary enteric anastomosis. We always hear about the concept of sump syndrome, so I just put a little slide on it. And what that is is basically when you get debris that collects in the distal common bile duct, and that is distal to your cholidocoduodenostomy, uh, as a result of uh, reflux from intestinal, intestinal contact uh, contents. And that can present it's been described as presenting with patients with a cholangitis-like picture, occasionally hepatic abscesses. Uh, typically, it's believed that inadequate anastomotic size and unfavorable configuration are two important factors that contribute to this. 
But this complication is very rare. Um, in the literature, it ranges from zero to, to about 10%, but if you look at modern series, it's more like one to 2%. I can tell you at our institution, it's extraordinarily rare with most of my partners tell, saying that they've uh, in fact never even seen um, a true case of confirmed sump syndrome. So in conclusion, cholidocodonostomy is a useful procedure for select patients with complex biliary stone disease and or endoscopically refractory strictures. Avoidance of tension is key, and creation of large anastomoses are, those are the two, I think, biggest uh, take-home points uh, when doing this. And then sump syndrome is a rare phenomenon, and it should not be a major deterrent uh, to performing this operation in otherwise appropriate patients. Thank you.